Hi, I'm Kip McClurg, one of the pastors at Vestavia Hills United Methodist Church, and we're so grateful that you've decided to participate in Disciple Bible. Now, I'll be providing uh, for each session several different video clips teaching about what's going on in your Disciple uh, Bible Study Manual. But to truly understand and participate in Disciple, you have to understand that what I say or the teachings that I, I am giving through video are not really how Bible study happens. It happens when a group of people get together who look together at God's Word and, and find a guide uh, such as a, a book like this that helps them together to find out what God is saying. And so I would encourage you, if you haven't uh, purchased one of these or gotten one of these, to find the study manual on Disciple. And the leader of your group should have the leader's guide as well. But I welcome you to this experience, and I look forward to being with you each session. Well, this is our final episode of Disciple Bible through Luke and Acts, and this is lesson number 12. We're looking at really what are the priorities that, uh, that we've learned uh, from, from our other lessons and from these two books and from the writer of Luke. This last lesson is about those priorities. And Luke's purpose was to convince people that there is a full, challenging, and fulfilling life when we leave our nets and we follow Jesus. But we have to, at some point, make the choice to drop those nets. And we have to start walking. The authors of the book divide the prioritizing of life into five different categories. And we're going to sort of review each of those. The first priority of life is that God has to be first. Just like the Ten Commandments, where having no gods before me is number one, it's practically impossible to become all that we can be in God if God is not first in our life. Life purpose statements uh, are a way to sort of put on paper what you really believe. I when I was a young, young pastor, I started writing a purpose statement for my life. Why is it that I exist? What has God called me to? And I would revise that document over the years, but it gave me a lot of, of clarity in times of difficulty, in times of should I, what should I do with my life at this moment? This opportunity has come. This door is closed. Uh, what, what am I really about? Uh, but I would go back to that purpose statement, and, and I would hear again what the core of who I was uh, believed that, that God had called me to do. So that document has, has guided me over the years. I would encourage you to think about that. What is it that God has called you to do? What is your purpose? What gifts have God, has God given you that you need to prioritize it and to make God first and let God use those gifts for God's glory? A second of life's priority is time. Now, the easiest way that I find to track that priority is to look back at your calendar and see your, how your time is prioritized. Is worship a priority? When you look back at, at your calendar, did you make time to go to, to worship with other people? Uh, did you make time to learn about God? It, you're, you're a part of a Disciple Bible class, so you've done some of that. Uh, did you make time to serve other people and to find a way to help those who are the most vulnerable? What about time to rest and pray? To become a real priority in our lives, sometimes we have to block off time for what, what seems like silly things, but in, in the big eternal picture, they're very high priorities. And so sometimes our calendars are an easy way for us to see how we've prioritized the time that God has given to us. A third of life priorities is money. When I was in my mid-30s and my wife and I had been married just a few years, I was a pastor of a small church on a modest salary. And I remember it was a presidential election year and uh, the candidates released their, their income statements. And they released how much uh, they had given uh, to different causes and to charitable contributions. And it was amazing to me that one of the candidates had literally given millions, multiple millions of dollars to charities and, and churches. 
and the other candidate had given less than my small family on on a, a, a small church salary, they had given less than we had. It really changed my mind about that candidate because I realized that that candidate's priority, he truly didn't put his money where his mouth was. He expected other people to pay for his priorities, but at a personal gut level, he didn't give of his own resources for what he believed in. Uh, now, my family was not wealthy by any stretch, so what he gave wasn't a whole lot, was 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 a really small amount of money. Uh, but I believe what Wesley said: we are called to to make all we can, save all we can, and give all we can. And we've tried to make that a part of our house because what we do with our money for our family is important. I've tried to share with our children our giving. And I pray that they will, as they continue in life, pick those habits up because it really reflects who you are in what you give your money toward. Uh, our family drives old cars. We, we decided a long time ago that we, would, we wouldn't buy new cars. And uh, the older I get, the older the cars get. Uh, and I, I enjoy it because I, I, if I bump into something and put a scratch or a dent, I don't call them scratches or dents. I call them tattoos. And I consider, I, I want as many tattoos on this car as possible. As long as I don't hit somebody else's car, uh, it's okay. And then at some point, when I've driven it long enough, I just give it away. Now, with what we give, we could certainly afford to buy nicer cars and drive much nicer automobiles. But for our family, that was one way. It is one way that we're constantly reminded that uh, the things of this world don't matter, but what we do with our money and how we give to God does matter. And so it, it is one way for us to prioritize uh, our, our life. Family responsibility is another life priority that the authors talk about. There are many different kinds of family structures. And following Jesus means that we participate and help, but are not dominated by the priorities of other people in our family if their priorities are in conflict with God. It becomes difficult at times if you're a follower of Jesus and other family members are not. They're not going to be able to understand um, your, your perspective. They're not going to be able to understand why you're doing what you're doing. Uh, you want to honor family and you want to have responsibility with those. But if God is ultimately in control, then sometimes we have to make choices that reflect our following Jesus and not following someone else. We're called to honor our marriage vows and honor and care for the well-being, as we learn in Exodus, of our parents. And we are to teach our children about the faith and pray that when they are old, when they grow older, that that faith becomes their faith. So as we live a life of priority, as we have learned from, from Luke and Acts uh, and from Genesis and Exodus, uh, we are called upon to, uh, to teach our children well. And the fifth of life priorities that uh, the authors talk about is to be open to the needs of other people. I hope that you have found persons uh, whose lives were in need that you've been able to help. I hope that you have found a way to help them and, and to give of your resources and time to help persons who are vulnerable and who are not able to fully uh, to live independently or, or need a helping hand at that moment or, or an assistance at that moment. I, I like to talk about at, uh, at Christmas the story of, of the inn. We, uh, we think of the inn, and there was no room in the inn, and of course they had to, to sleep literally in the barn. Uh, we think of an inn as a, as a hotel. But in reality, they were just a spare room. Perhaps... Uh, there had been a, a, an in-law or a mom or a dad who had passed away and they had, a, had built a room onto the, onto the house. And so uh, they would rent that house out to people who were passing by and they could stay there for the night. Um, we, we took seriously this question of, of helping people in need and sometimes probably did, did more than we should have or perhaps not in the way we should have. 
But we've always had tried to own a home that had one more bedroom than we needed. And we always wanted a spare room so that there would be room in the inn. And in our life, our married life so far, we've had seven people live with us in our spare room. Um, some of those have been parents, or sometimes it was a sibling, a friend, or a person in crisis. We've taken on uh, children uh, and teenagers in, in sort of uh, from DHR at times. Uh, those, those times and lengths went from three months to, to five years. And they were not always easy, and I perhaps would not repeat all of them. But for us, I, it has been a, a calling in our life that if we're really serious about following Jesus, then we have to, when someone comes across our path that seems to need God's help, we're, we're called to help them. And so I would ask you, what, where have you made a spare room? Where have you made spare time? Where have you created and carved out of your life the opportunity to be open to people who are in need, to people who are shut in, or children who are in difficult home situations, who could use a mentor, or to the hungry? If we truly prioritize our lives, if we truly are followers of Jesus Christ, if we follow out the gospel that, that Paul and the early disciples claimed that we should follow, then we're called upon to prioritize what's most important and give the best to God. And now let's pause and consider these ideas and the questions that are in your book.